From Chicago's CAN TV, a look at the week's events is reported in the newspapers, in the blogs and online, and on radio and TV. This is Chicago Newsroom. Well, hi there and welcome to the show. So here's a crazy thought to get us started. <clears throat> what if a group of aldermen not beholden to the mayor for political favors or even help getting elected or reelected? What if a group of them started proposing serious legislation? I know you're laughing and raising thoughtful alternatives to the status quo. What if there were just enough of them, say maybe about a dozen, that they could hold press events and the media would cover them seriously? Could they achieve a level of prominence with enough gravitas that the mayor and his allies would actually want to sit down and listen to them and maybe craft legislation they could support? <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, as I said, this is a crazy notion. This is, after all, the city council of the city of Chicago. But something is happening. The city council progressive reform caucus now has at least 11 members, and they're having substantive meetings with Mayor Emanuel. In fact, one of our guests today had a cancel because the mayor had called him to his office to talk about TIFFs, of all things. And their voice on school issues and taxation appears to be getting louder and clearer. So today, we have two members of the Chicago Progressive Reform Caucus joining us to talk about progressive reform. Why not, right? <laughs> Alderman Scott Wagespeck is the chair of the group, and it's fair to say, I think, I, we could call you a founding member, couldn't sure, we? Yeah. I, I think that's what you are. And also, Alderman Susan Sedlowski-Garza is joining us, one of the new members of the caucus and new members of the council. <clears throat> she pulled off that incredible victory in the far south side 10th Ward, dispatching longtime administration loyalist John Pope in the last election. And it's also worth pointing out that Mayor Emanuel did not support either of these candidates in the past election, and in fact, he worked against them. I remember seeing the uh, posters about how you favored potholes, if I remember correctly. Uh, yeah, that was true. Those were the, some of the worst uh, <laughs> flyers that had gone out from the mayor's side. And, uh, you know, it was interesting because um, it kind of exposed just the way he didn't care about management of the city, the basic things that people care about, garbage pickup, tree trims, filling mm -hmm. the potholes, which, you know, every year are pretty bad. And uh, I think it just backfired on him. But yeah. um, So why did you vote in favor of keeping potholes? Yeah, well, <laughs> you know, that's a Chicago tradition. So, <laughs> that's um, right. It wouldn't be Chicago <laughs> anymore. Right? Without potholes. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, it really kind of exposed um, years of, you know, lack of management. But it mm -hmm. also helped a lot of people like uh, Alderman Garza to get elected. And, mm -hmm. you know, when you kind of mention that in your um, preface there, uh, it's great to have people side by side with us now who think the same way, who think yeah. about issues in a, in a different way than most of the council. And now that we have a good, strong coalition in building, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's made things a lot easier for those of us who've been around for yeah. a while. Um, we've, we've got more issues to talk about and it's just been a, a great movement that is building uh, for the whole city. Interesting. So, uh, Alderman yeah. Garza, mm -hmm. I mean, you're just another public official who owes your loyalty to the Koch brothers because they oh. essentially <laughs> helped you get elected, didn't they? Well, they they actually <laughs> sunk a lot of money into my uh, in my the former my former opponent. But um, mm. you know, we've been dealing with uh, Pet Coke for quite some time. We and should say they they own the companies that have been Pet, dumping yeah, all that brothers, wonderful stuff. Koch in Koch brothers own KCBX. Right. Um, at one time, the pet coke piles were about ten stories tall, and um, it's really pet coke has really remained kind of a, a hidden issue, and nobody really knew about it, yeah. um, I including the city council. Yeah. Uh, we are pushing forward. Actually, the Progressive Caucus, um, part of our mm -hmm. environmental team, has taken up pet coke as one of our main issues. Um, they the north site has been closed. But all they did was really transfer the pet coke to the south side. Mm -hmm. So um, we need to work harder to get rid of pet coke. Mayor Emanuel himself has come out publicly and said he doesn't want pet coke in Chicago. So um, pet coke piles are literally 500 yards from people's homes. Yeah, yeah. 500 yards. Uh, Detroit got rid of it. Um, now we're getting word that BP pulled out the contract. They're no longer going to be dealing with KCBX but now they're shipping it to Poughkeepsie, New York. So basically they're just kicking the can down the road. So. We, we, right. we wish you the best. Um, Dick Durbin and Robin Kelly are championing our cause as well and saying they can't just keep kicking the can down the road. So Well, I find it interesting that you um, were able to sort of pluck that cord in your ward where it didn't look like there would be that kind of um, 
a coalition around around this issue. But you were able, you, you were sensitive enough to it that you were able to make an issue out of it, and it really became a big deal. And it's interesting to see that a, that, a, that a, an alderman had been around for a generation or so, and and, and was comfortable in his in his uh, position. Too comfortable. Yeah, just really kind of didn't see it. Didn't see it as that big a deal. Didn't see it that. And and of course there were a lot of other things too. I remember we were covering how. They sort of had. They made him sort of uh, have to introduce the legislation in the city council. That, but he pulled the old switcheroo yeah, as well. Yeah, so. yeah. Well, anyway, it, it it was an it was a fascinating thing to see, and and uh, and it really does represent, I think, a, a pretty significant change in the tenth ward. Well, you know, I can't take credit for that myself. It, it was a true. Two and a half years ago, we literally sat in a in a front room of uh, Katie Koval's front room and and just really started to organize, organize around the issue. I mean, mm -hmm. we were out there in 40 degrees below zero picketing the Koch brothers plant. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they started to take us seriously when we just started to grow and grow and grow. So my job now is, um, older woman, is to get the word out to people and let them know that this stuff exists. Mm -hmm. So. Well, you were you were instrumental in helping John Pope get a really nice job with the city. <laughs> oh, I did. I lobbied for you that. You did your part. Well, I mean, in, in a position that had been closed for two and a half years, which I found very yeah. interesting. <laughs> in our briefing, in our one of our budget briefings, they said that they they cut out you know some of the top heavy jobs and vacated some of the positions uh, that were had been vacant. And um, I asked the question, "How did you determine which ones were going to be filled?" and they said, well, that, that was up to the mayor, so. Uh -huh. well, there's a couple hundred available at any given time. Exactly. So. Yeah. They, they, they they just, they're just floating no around. No positions waiting. available for teachers or other yeah. positions no. we need. No. But there's but, definitely yeah. well, appointees should we, available. Should we, um, should we, well, actually, you know what, I want to, I do want to talk about schools, but, I mean, we should talk about, we should talk about what's in the news today. Uh, there is, uh, there seem, according to the Chicago Sun-Times and to Fran Spielman, so therefore it must be true, uh, there, <laughs> there appears to be a, co a, a, a coalescing of aldermen with the mayor to uh, come up with a garbage fee. Is, have you heard of this? Do you, do you approve of this? Is this progressive? Well, I think, um, you know, there's other cities that do pay as you throw, uh, but they have a much more sophisticated system. We're still basing ours on an old system where you know everything just goes in the black cans. Um, mm -hmm. The the blue can uh, recycling system is still uh, not at the point that it should be. The city doesn't do enough in terms of education, mm -hmm. um, and we've got a lot of issues. And it goes back to this issue of the pet coke. It goes back to the BP uh, Whiting refinery. A lot of environmental issues that aren't being addressed, and I think the trash pickup falls mm -hmm. into that. But mm -hmm. you know when you look at um, the mayor basically coming out and saying, hey, this is a great idea. He's, it's one of those things where he kind of throws it to the alderman because he knows it might be pretty unpopular. <laughs> right, yeah, let, um, let you guys take Now, it might be a good idea yeah. to charge people, you know, five or ten dollars uh, a month for mm -hmm. trash mm -hmm. right. and make, and kind of force people to recycle more. Mm -hmm. But you have to have an education component with right. that, and we right. do not do that in the city, yeah, and that's right. what's really sad about the, you know, the fact that he came in, he cut out the Department of Environment. We no mm -hmm. longer have one. We need to get that back in. And I think, you know, we've been talking about a lot of these environmental issues as a progressive caucus. Yes. Yeah. And trying to show people that there's ways to do things better, right. and we just haven't seen it yet. You know, one of the things, too, with garbage pickup, uh, it, it, just like Scott said, it, you know, it's about education. A lot of people don't even know that they don't pay for garbage. They think it's rolled into their taxes, you know, mm -hmm. just like sewer and water. Um, I don't think pay as you go, pay as you throw is a good idea. Um, we're going to have people throw, you know, in the middle of the night going and stuffing <laughs> other people's garbage right, cans, right. and then we'll be getting thousands of yeah, calls the, saying, mm -hmm. they're throwing garbage well, I was going to say, the, the alderman would get a thousand pounds. Right. Yeah, but, exactly. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's right. But I think, uh, you know, what he's searching for is uh, different ways to fix his budget gap. Right. Mm -hmm. And it is astronomical right now. Right, now, right, what right. I guarantee you that what we'll see, and this happens every year, and it's, it's become higher and higher every year under uh, Mayor Emanuel, they throw out a huge number, and mm -hmm. then by the time we get to the actual budget, that number is a lot lower. Right. But the problem is that he is not putting uh, any effort into going after the issues that are really affecting our bottom line and our yeah. budget cap. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, you can sit there and talk about the the garbage pickup issue, and hey, it'll raise a few million dollars, but. We're not addressing the issues that the IG has come up with um, in terms of auditing the different programs that we already have and the waste inefficiencies. 
inefficiencies. Well, you, you said the uh, garbage audit says that it's been done wrong for years. Right. Yeah. And I'm probably yeah. decades would be a closer. Yeah, and even when the inspector general has said, here, here's a way to fix it, they haven't really done that. Mm -hmm. um, and that's problematic. I think it just it it shows that there's no effort being made by the administration to really tackle these old. Well, they did they issues. did do the grid system, which appears oh. to be working, <clears throat> right? Am Not I really. Right I, no, 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 it doesn't. No, the grid system it's horrible. What? How is it? How is it not working? Well, I mean, uh, for, I'm just I'm going to throw this scenario out there. Uh, our garbage pickup in our ward is on Friday. If mm -hmm. they miss a street. Um, I can't get that garbage picked up oh, yeah. until the following Friday because all the trucks are in another ward. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, we had garbage pick up the 4th of July this year. Our garbage pickup day is Friday. Um, they picked up the garbage on Thursday because of the, uh, the holiday. Right. Mm -hmm. And that whole weekend, you know, people were off on Friday. So Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, the garbage was loaded. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were inundated with calls on Monday. And we couldn't get garbage pickup till the following week. So, so you, you think that it was a better system when it was controlled by the individual wards? I do. Oh. Yeah, I do. Well, there needed to be parameters on what was happening there, too. But it doesn't allow for any more flexibility. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there, you've got to say there were all kinds of horrendous problems. Problems yeah, with that, were. where you'd have streets zigzagging around, and yeah. one crew is picking up one side of the street, and I mean, it just a modified <coughs> grid would work, but yeah. I, I think right. they need to be more flexible in the way mm -hmm. they do it. Yeah. Yeah. And we just have to start looking at some alternative sources of revenue. Um, you know, again, in, in one of these budget hearings that we sat, I, I was <coughs> we the city lost 2.5 million dollars in in taxi cab uh, license fees. You know, we need to look at maybe taxing, uh, you know, have Uber drivers pay a license fee. They're not U they're mm -hmm. not licensed, they're not regulated, there's no background checks. Um, they should be held to the same standards that the taxi cab drivers are being held to. I mean, I can have a guy walk off the street and just say, I'm going to be an Uber driver. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's we, we know why that happened. Well, I mean, that was basically know why the mayor's brother that's that right. was major so, owner in the company. And, and 2.5 million, sorry, no, 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 2 million is just a drop in the bucket when we're looking yeah. at the yeah. at the deficit. Well, there is that. Now, now, of course, you guys have had press conferences talking about your vision for raising much more money. And a lot of it does involve the state legislature. Good luck it with does. that, of course. Mm -hmm. But, but I mean, you do have some other ideas for uh, service taxes and... Uh, well, the, I guess the uh, fat person tax uh, kind of, I don't know what's happening with that, but uh, is, it, is it possible, and the, I, the, the bigger question is, is it possible for the city of Chicago to raise the kind of money that it clearly has to raise in order to work its way out of some of these holes? Yeah, for sure, and I think mm -hmm. uh, if you just look at things in an equitable manner. Right. It without is, property taxes. Without, or, well. Or, or with, Let's say you have to raise property taxes. Um, <coughs> you can minimize that by doing all of the other things that people have pointed out is wrong with the city first. Mm -hmm. And that's what we haven't done. So when the inspector general says, look, I've given you these audits of how you're poorly running all of your systems within your departments, mm -hmm. fix those things first. That will, that will shave off a few hundred million dollars from what could be a major property tax hike. Now, C the CPS property tax hike might be different. There we know we need to raise money to, to make CPS solvent. That's mm -hmm. a state issue as well. Right. But um, when we proposed uh, you know, almost two dozen different ways of raising revenue, most of them are not about going to taxpayers and saying we're going to stick it with another bill like Mayor Emanuel's doing. We're basically saying fix all these problems first as um, you know, some of the mayoral candidates did in this last election. When you look back at that election, you know, the mayor was the only one with the solutions, a financial mm -hmm. solution. He had a plan. He had a plan, and the plan else. was basically, I'm going to borrow $1.9 <laughs> billion, dollars, and then I'm going to borrow $1.1 $1. 1 dollars. <laughs> and so you look at the borrowing that he's done, that has been his solution. Mm -hmm. Basically, that falls on us now and for our next couple generations of children yeah. who are getting stuck right. with that bill. The Blagojevich There's no plan, revenue is, uh, or borrowing is revenue. Yeah, so yeah. what we've been saying is, look, um, let's make it fair and equitable. Uh, we did propose a financial transaction tax. That's mm -hmm. a state issue mm -hmm. as well. Um, that could equalize us in terms of um, what we need in you know, revenue to slow down that property tax hike. Yeah. The mayor has flat out said, no. I'm not interested in most of what you guys have offered. Mm -hmm. um, his whole focus is on putting in a casino. Yeah, yeah. And That's not you know, instead of going down to help. Springfield and talking about a casino, why don't you go down to Springfield and talk about the issues that are really facing yeah, Chicagoans? Yeah, yeah. There's, a, a, there's a two hour program to be done on the um, transaction tax because I am really getting more and more convinced that 
<clears throat> it really is time to have that conversation. But, uh, you know, we had Ralph Martira in here uh, talking about this, and he says that the only way to do that is at the federal level because sure. it, the first state that does it is going to, you know, is going to get jumped on and, and yeah. nobody, well, think, nobody wants to go no, first. No, what we've talked <clears throat> about in terms of these state issues, and, you know, when you look at the lobbyists and the people who've gone down to Springfield back in the 80s and 90s and changed the laws down there that are now affecting Chicago much more um, broadly than they ever thought they would, um, you know, these are things that Springfield can change. Mm -hmm. Elected school board. No, right. that's, a, that's a yeah. very easy one. Mm -hmm. That people need to go down there and mm -hmm. change the system. And we've done. We've gone down to Springfield as a caucus and said, we need you guys to help us out. There's no reason we shouldn't have an elected school board. Ninety percent of Chicago city people in Chicago mm -hmm. voted yeah. for it. Yeah. I, again, we're, we are kind of jumping all over the place here. I know, but it's kind of fun There's to so do. So many issues. I mean, <clears throat> do you do you seriously believe that an elected school board, just getting an elected school board, would really change anything significantly at, at CPS? Absolutely. Absolutely. In what way? I, because I, I am, I'm one of these people who has just been pounded on both sides by this, and I just, I've given up on well, even having an opinion about it. I think, it uh, let me give you an example of how this could work, and then Sue can talk about how the contracts and all the, and, you know, the financing could work. You bring people up through the local LSCs, you have a regional LSC that they go to, and then those people... Um, would then be able to run for mm -hmm. a citywide board. That's a sort of so a, you would a very have simple to go model. through that vetting process in order right. to run. Right. I mean, the mayor could. You know, some people say, "Hey, have a hybrid." The mayor could appoint two or three people. Mm -hmm. The rest get elected, um, but they have to have served on LSCs at mm -hmm. a local and regional level mm -hmm. to get that point, so but that they already understand. If you were a billionaire, though, how would you be? How would you be able to go through that process? You don't have well, kids in the school. Then, he, then that billionaire <laughs> can sit there and go to the lo be a community rep at one of the local school boards instead of doing what the mm -hmm. mayor and some of these other guys do, okay. which is send their kids to private schools and tell everybody else how to run their kids. And that's the whole problem. We can't have billionaires sitting on our school board that are they're making decisions that they know nothing about. They know nothing about. Um, you know it. it baffles me to the the 20 million dollar no bid contract that Barbara Bird Bennett the soups academy oh that I, yes that um 20 million dollars do you realize that what that could have done for schools i mean yeah. you know it, it's it baffles me i spent 21 years in a, inside of a school and what's happening in these schools is is an atrocity to me um why are charter schools getting more money than neighborhood schools um, there has to be somebody that sits on this elected school board mm -hmm. that knows what's happening inside the classroom. And I, and I agree with Scott. There has to be a vetting process. But we need people that know what's happening in the trenches. And I don't really believe that anybody on that board has actually, well, now there is a teacher. Sure. But for the last, uh, you know, a couple decades, it's been right. people mm -hmm. in Pe the corporate world who right. don't even send their kids to the yeah. public schools right. here, yeah. barely step into a public school. And you, you see Henry Beenan, I mean, making the comments that he made recently. Yeah. And, we don't know, have it's a voice. A total but disconnect. I, but I'm still, uh, I don't want to beat this dead horse because we really have to move on, but, but I'm still not convinced, although maybe if, if well, I don't know, I mean, is it legal to, to have that kind of vetting process where you, the only candidates that can run are people who have come up through this other thing? Well, sure. It, yeah, and you know, just create legislation court. around it. And, yeah. and we're the only, we're the only county that doesn't have an elected school board. Mm -hmm. Only major city, too. Mm -hmm. Only major, major city. Yeah. city. I mean, yeah. that, that's it, we don't have a voice. Mm -hmm. And you know, democracy is giving people a voice. And we don't have a voice when it comes to CPS. And we all know what a mess that's turned into. Mm -hmm. So there has to be a change. That it has to happen now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, strike while the iron is hot is a, is a great analogy right now. So we, it needs to happen. I think one of the one of the real disasters has been the the gutting of the whole LSC concept. I mean, for all of its weaknesses, and there sure. were many, mm -hmm. uh, it was a real kind of an incipient democracy, and it it was it, it was beginning to really show some promise but I think you know like community policing those things mm. uh, it's that's just it's just too messy to mess around with all those little people going to meetings and stuff it's just we need more efficiency than that <laughs> got to be efficient so I mean you, you guys said the other day that you wanted to prioritize neighborhood schools over privately run charters and I, I mean I think that's a that's certainly you know if it's not number one or two on the progressive agenda I don't know where it is but I, we, we've we've talked about that incessantly on this program. The 
the idea that um, if the charters aren't getting more money than the neighborhood schools, they are less susceptible to cuts than the than the city, the. Uh, the district run schools right. and what we're seeing with the and I'm sure these are happening in both your wards with these with the traditional high schools where they're just being gutted from the inside right they are. and it's it's sort of like a self-fulfilling prophecy it's just kind of like well look these schools aren't working nobody wants to go there but they're not working because there's no investment there mm -hmm. um, I have a, a Bowen High School right next to it is a charter school mm -hmm. I'm not gonna even say its name they have literally plucked and plucked and plucked these kids with you know a marketing scheme and a rhetoric and they've plucked these kids out of Bowen mm -hmm. which has been doing some really great things mm -hmm. and they can't compete because Bowen's budget was cut 1.3 million dollars when the school right next door was in their budget was increased yeah, yeah. so I mean you don't stand a chance not to mention that they get other subsidies and that they have yes. the ability to raise money on their own which and they, have the, don't they have. have the ability to you know get, kick students out at the drop of a hat yeah yeah, yeah. You, you were talking about Schur's the other night weren't you I mean, you were you were at Schur, at the Schur's uh, no that was Alderman Arena oh I'm sorry uh, I'm sorry I'm yeah, yeah. Who happens they do to look be another they do yeah look we do yeah 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 right. but he's been very proactive on the Schur's issue and several of the north side right, um, right. high schools you know I think mm -hmm. we all as a as a group we're all on the same page with that uh, yeah. it all comes down from one person there's one directive about how mm -hmm. we're going to run schools, and mm -hmm. that's what needs to change. Do you have any any hope for Forrest Claypool as a as a good manager that he might uh, he might not look really at these things no, out? I don't. Uh, <laughs> right, well, I, there's a directive from the mayor, and you know he takes right. the directive, and he, that's that's what everybody else has done right, that right. was exactly. before him. Well, actually, you know that raises something that uh, on the soft side of the conversation here, something that I really was fascinated to talk to you guys about is the mayor himself. You we see that you're having some conversations with him you're you're at least having some level of engagement with him more I would think than could have ever been possible with daily yeah. is that correct I mean do you find him to be a, a, an intellectually curious guy who's an interesting challenger to your ideas or, or is he just a closed-minded guy well, I think he's found himself in dire straits, and that's why okay. he, he needs to s step to us and say, um, I need some ideas, at least yeah. ones that I can agree with. Yeah. And um, I think, you know, he's found himself in a position where he, none of his policies have worked, uh -huh. frankly. Um, he's in the election. In the election. I mean, the election. He lost the election, you basically. Know, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think the, the election, he needed to open his eyes, and I mean, I, quite frankly, it, it scared the hell out of him. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you don't have, I mean, like if you just ran into him in the elevator, do you have a cordial relationship with him? Or, I don't know, does he take elevators? I don't know. <laughs> uh, you know, yeah, and we've had we've had one-on-one -on -one after the election. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Our policy uh, views are different, and mm -hmm. I think they always will be. Um, he does some things like with the minimum wage. You know, we were pushing uh, mm -hmm. very strong on the getting a new minimum wage. Yeah. And he finally came around and said, okay, I'll do something. I'll phase it in over the next uh, five years. And mm -hmm. I think that was a victory for the Progressive Caucus and progressives throughout the city and state and the nation um, to see a, a major um, U.S. city kind of move in that direction. Yeah. But you guys so, have been pushing for 15, right? Right. Yeah, and I think, I think we knew that there had to be some kind of compromise there. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we were willing to take that. But I think he realized it, too, that he was in, in again in dire straits with his election and he had to make some kind of move and that's that's what we've seen on several issues that he's starting to I think look at things a little bit differently right. because he knows that we were very effective mm -hmm. in this last election and at least have the conversation yeah right how do you read his change on tiffs I mean is it uh, are tiffs fixed now now that uh, <laughs> not even close no. but no. it's interesting There's, though that that he did he moved rather you know, broadly you mean on, on, on shutting down the TIFs and the Well, you know, when there's 160 plus TIFs in the city of Chicago, you still have a long way to go. Mm -hmm. um, we How have, many do you have in your ward? I have, well, with the new ward, probably five, where I touch five or six, but... I um, You do? You know, mm -hmm. we have... We have a city that is uh, one-third of it, I think, is covered in TIFs. Mm -hmm. That's more than any other city in the United States. We divert billions of dollars a year mm -hmm. we're gonna I, I don't know what the number is going to be at the end of this year but we divert billions 
from the, the overall tax base. So what that is is basically you and I as homeowners are going to pay more in property taxes because of this imbalance, and that's what people need to understand. Now, the mayor and his floor leader and some of these other folks out there will say, hey, we're going to have a boon of money when, when these things end 20 years from now. Mm. Well, guess what? We have a crisis right yeah. now. Mm -hmm. The imbalance has been created. We need to fix it more drastically than we are. Mm -hmm. and, and it's just not working in well, the way it should. You know, the interesting part is that when he ran for his first election, he had a, a whole committee do a major yeah. TIF reform study. Right. And nothing in that study has been implemented. Oh, I, I thought he said he reformed TIFs. So I, I, yeah. I was I mean, pretty sure he said that. But when you, when there you has to be a complete reform. Yeah. There's no yeah. There's no transparency. Uh -huh. So what am I missing? What, what are the big issues that we haven't touched on here that, that are really key to the Progressive Caucus? Mm. Well, <laughs> we're, you know, we are Others. talking. <laughs> yeah, I think our list is so long. It's, yeah. it's unbelievable. Yeah. What, we, what we've recognized as a group, and especially having Sue and some of these other new aldermen on board, it's helping us look at the bigger picture of what's going on in the city. So yeah. Sue's ward is the 10th ward, all the way down at the southern end of the city. We never really knew what was going on down there. She actually let us in to her ward and we had a few dozen people show up mm -hmm. um, yeah. that wanted to talk to us about the issues we're gonna face, yeah. mm -hmm. police accountability, um, how Pet we look Coke. at that, Pet Coke, the environmental Metra. issues. Metra. Yeah. Metra. We are, Metra, and not to cut you off, but no, that's fine. we are having a huge issue with Metra. Um, we, uh, the, Same. the Metra, mm -hmm. it, it's the end of the line. 92nd Street is the end of the line. Um, there's an adjacent parking lot that's managed by CPS, Central Parking Systems. Every day we have probably four to five break-ins, window smashes. They, they jack up the car, they take all four tires, they leave, they steal the catalytic converters. We have been working with Metro Police who tell us it's CPS's problem. CPS tells us it's Metro's problem. Mm -hmm. Now I find out that the city of Chicago owns the parking lot and CPS manages the parking lot. CPS will not return my phone call. Central parking mm -hmm. system, Simple not the school not system. The school. Right. Um, we can't get a straight answer from anyone. Mm -hmm. um, there is a, 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 there's a hut there for security which no one is there. I'm calling for Metra and CPS to split the cost of a security guard. Um, it's, it's, you know, people ride the train, it's, it's a busy stop and people ride the train every day and they pay, someone's there every day to collect the money. Yeah. Someone needs to be there to ensure that these vehicles are safe. Well, believe it or not, we've chewed up the whole half hour here. Um, is there, is there optimism? Can somebody like me be optimistic that the rubber stamp city council is going to be slightly less rubbery in the next year or two? Yeah, I think with us think so. you can say that. Um, if people went, if they Google Progressive Caucus Chicago and they mm -hmm. look at our website, not every issue is going to be on there. I mean, we get yeah. inundated with issues every day. We try to address them. They don't always show up in the paper or on our website. People should go look at it yeah, and see I'm, what we're addressing. It's a, it's a good, it's a good site. Thank you, I'm sorry. Sorry I have to cut you up because of the That's clock okay. says. We appreciate we you having us. No, thank right. you so much. Thanks Alderman Garza. Thanks Alderman Wagespeck for being with us here today. You've been watching Chicago Newsroom. It's a community service of Can TV. You can watch us anytime or if you have the time, find us right here. You can watch us wherever, whenever you want. As we always say, we're great beach watching. I'm Ken Davis, we'll be back to you next week on Chicago Newsroom. Thanks for watching, see you then, bye.